you will never be able to seize the initiative if you're not willing to accept risk to do so. You've got to be able to understand the risk that you're taking, mitigate the, you know, the, the negative consequences of that risk, but you've got to be willing to take the risk if you want to achieve great success. fellow leaders, and welcome to the Military Leader Podcast, where you can find conversations with today's most successful leaders. I am Andrew Stedman, and thank you for being part of the Military Leader community and for investing in your own leadership by listening to this episode. I am so excited about the response to General Brown's interview that kicked off the podcast. Over 3,000 people have tuned in so far, and many have pushed it on social media, left iTunes ratings, and have shown their support with online comments. I do want to mention that you should take a moment and read the heartfelt iTunes review by Shade1020 on June 4th. You may recall that in his interview, General Brown mentioned Captain Bill Jacobson, who was tragically killed in the Mosul 2004 Chow Hall bombing when General Brown was serving as brigade commander. Well, in this review, Shade1020 gives a candid story about Captain Jacobson and how he invested in this person's life. It's well worth a moment to read, and I want to thank Shade1020 for adding context about Bill. Okay, we are off to a great start, and I've got another good one for you. Today, you'll get to hear from the man behind the curtain of Dr. Man, former Army colonel and director of the Business and Organizational Leadership Graduate Program at the University of Kansas, Steve Leonard. If you're in the Army and you have Facebook, you know Dr. Man. What started out as cartoon drawings about the purgatory of staff life and general officer quips has grown into a social media platform approaching 200,000 followers. Steve tells the entire story here, then goes on to share practical life and leadership lessons from his career as a strategist, his life as a writer, and his first duty as a husband and father. Aside from Dr. Mann and KU, Steve is also a non-resident fellow at the Modern War Institute at West Point, a co-founder of Divergent Options, a co-founder and board member of the Military Writers Guild, and a frequent contributor to the Atlantic Council's Art of Future Warfare Project. You are going to like this one. Thanks so much for listening. Here is Steve Leonard. Uh, today, I have the distinct privilege to chat with Steve Leonard. Uh, Steve, how you doing? I'm doing great, Drew. How are you? Doing great. Great. Thanks for joining us today. I'm uh, really excited to chat with you. Um, and uh, so I wanted to dive right in. I wanted to ask you about a pretty contentious topic and one that strikes right to the core of uh, the Army today. Um, I wanted to ask you what in the world you have against reflective belts anyway. <laughs> it's funny that you asked that. I was speaking at an event last night, and this came up, and uh, it always seems to come up. And I, I, I told a story about uh, the the genesis of this whole thing goes back to the very early days of the reflective belts. My first platoon sergeant was a, a guy named Wes Dennison, and uh, when, when the when the propagation of reflective belts first began, he refused to wear one. Under no, under no circumstances would he wear them, and, and if, if I even got close to one, he would give me the, the evil eye. And when I'd ask him what the big deal was, he would say, hey, sir, have you ever seen a bus drive into a PT formation? All right. <laughs> no. He said, and you know what? That's what we got road guards for. And if the road guards can't stop the bus, a reflective belt won't stop the bus. And, and so over the years – I, I I followed that mantra. I, I never wore a reflective belt unless I absolutely had to. And, and so it, it always became a joke because I would lean back on those words of Sergeant Dennison and, you know, where's your reflective belt? And I don't see a bus running over the formation today. So <laughs> right. and I don't see a bus coming into the gym. It's it's just a funny it's just a funny little thing and it you know it reaches back to the past and and it's my way of honoring an old an old buddy and you know my my yeah. first battle buddy so yeah so that that found your way uh, that found its way into your cartoons pretty pretty early didn't it oh yeah because everywhere you go you'd see somebody who would uh, well we're gonna have. Uh, reflective belts that are color coded my rank or we're going to put our rank on the color coat or on the belts or we're all going to wear you know reflective belts on our arms on our legs and around our waist and and the ridiculousness of it all just it made for something fun to make uh, to make light of 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is certainly still going on today. On, on my, <laughs> I, I, I inherited a reflective belt from my predecessor and it's got the uh, it's got the division. It's got my call sign, the rank, the uh, unit crest and, and the unit symbol, which, you know, the patch, the hourglass. So um, th- the tradition yeah. continues. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. If you don't mind, we'd love to hear the the origin story. I mean, from just you know the inception and and you know how it's grown over the years and, and what it's uh, what it's become today. So there's there's uh, the, the origin story is kind of an interesting thing. I grew up around comic books, and I was that little kid, you know, that would uh, you know, go blow a quarter, pick up a copy of Spider Man, curl up somewhere in a in a out in the grass and just enjoy it, read it a hundred times, and. I grew up all around that culture of, of superheroes, and I had come out of Iraq in 2004 and at OIF-1, and, and it had been a fairly, uh, uh, I don't want to say a frustrating part of my career, but it was it was, it was was a tough time, uh, and I, I landed the job that I would have least expected to ever get, which was I was hoping to come back to Fort Leavenworth and take the podium and teach, and I ended up... Uh, being selected to be part of the FM three O team, which I didn't realize it was a, it was, that was a good thing at the time. I felt like I was being sent off to purgatory and, um, surrounded by some of the most unique people that you'd ever meet. Um, and just the most amazing collection of, of, of personality, some very fascinating folks and, and every single one of them could have fit into a comic book lifestyle. And so Doctrine Man was was a combination of two things. One, the cartoon itself, I have almost no artistic skill. But so which is why you see stick figures even today. But the cartoon was a way to kind of vent the the pent up frustrations after a long deployment and and a couple of interesting years as a field grade. And it, it brought together the passion of uh, of sharing knowledge and helping others grow and learn and develop. And th- so, in, in my job as a doctrine writer, I would I would routinely share articles, and we'd have like little conversations amongst ourselves. And it started as a small group of folks, you know, five five six people in an office, just kind of sharing things. And occasionally I would throw in, I would take a cartoon and I would redraw a cartoon and, and send it out. And the car, the cartoons were a little cathartic. The articles served a different purpose and they kind of came together. And at some point I was doing an interview with the Army Times uh, 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 and, and the reporter had made a crack that – I was like a doctrine man, like a doctrine superhero, and we all laughed and a light bulb went off because the most unlikely community to ever have a superhero would be the doctrine community. And and I thought, well, you know, this is perfect because now I can evolve this and and, and so it percolated a little bit and and that that became part of it. And that, well, what happened was as you bring the two together, doctrine man started to grow. Then it became, hey, what you ought to send this to this person, or can hey, can my buddy get on the email distro? Uh huh. And, and and it so it built over the course. We started about, I want to say, I probably started about two thousand five, two thousand six, and. And it was an email distro list, so kind of like Warlord Loop. If you ever followed Warlord Loop, but unlike Warlord Loop, I actually found that there's a limit to the number of people that you can put on an email, and we got there, and I didn't know what to do. And I thought, hey, there's this Facebook thing, you know. I don't really know that much about. Well, I'll try. I'll try that, and I put it on Facebook, and people started to subscribe. And the next thing you know. You've got a thousand followers, and then two thousand followers, and then three thousand followers, and it just, like you said earlier, it just exploded. And you know, now we're sitting at around one hundred and sixty-five thousand people on Facebook, another uh, sixteen, seventeen thousand on Twitter, and it's just, it's its own world, and it's a, it's enveloping. Believe me, it it can take all my time if I allow it to. Yeah, that's. I, I think that's. Um... It's incredible because, you know, content producers out, out here, you know, bloggers and marketers, you know, they, they fight for years to get an email subscription list. And you you had one in 2005 on an official army email before it was cool. That's great. Yeah. And the whole That's thing, cool. it's funny because the whole thing with the secret identity was was almost a, a joke 
because as we as I evolved the character, I thought, well, I want something obvious because people who knew me, at least the original probably thousand people, they all knew there was no secret because they were on the email. So I wanted an identity that was Clark Kentish, that anybody who looked at me could figure it out, but I wouldn't have to tell them. And and so when people did discover over time, uh, it was they, they'd look at you and they'd say, oh, I knew it all along. I just didn't know it was right in front of me. And it's because my humor comes out, the way I talk comes out, the way I engage comes out. It's really it, – everything's – Everything is there, but it's like Clark Kent. He puts the glasses on. You don't know it's Superman. Takes the glasses off. You say, oh, it's Superman. And it's, it's the, so it was the same. It was part of the gag to just make it so obvious that everybody would figure it out. And then no one figured it out. And then that became part of the fun. You have no idea how much fun it was to be able to sit in a room with General Odierno and have him make a comment about, God, I hope Doctrin Man's nowhere around to hear this. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and, and you say, Oh, a contraire, a doctor uh, man, right here in the corner that's taking right. you notes. Start sketching right now. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and I did. I, I would sit and uh, probably for the last 10 years of my career, I worked all at the three and four star level and I sat in the back of meetings and I would flip my green notebook to the back and I would say, okay, here's an idea. You know, we're, we're going to do, we're going to do a chief of staff of the army cartoon, a sec army cartoon, a sec defense cartoon. And we would have little things and I would write down Little things I heard, and then that would be the genesis of a of a new cartoon. General officer speak lists, things like that. Little little things that you would only pick up in those meetings. That's right. That's right. I mean, I think it's brilliant because it captures the essence of it's kind of captures the inside joke of whether it's staff life or whether it's you know life you know living under the you know the the tyranny of a, of a first sergeant or something. I mean, it, it really like it speaks to many levels in the army. Um, and so and so it was car- it was cartoons for a long time. Um, and you probably have, I mean, you have hundreds of cartoons. I bet. I mean, have you kept count over the years? No, I haven't even tried. Uh, it's it the the cartoons themselves are are funny because I I went from doing one a day, seven days a week initially, to where I do probably five or six a month, and it's and it's interesting because as I have exercised the demons of uh, multiple deployments, it I don't feel the need to do cartoons as much anymore because it's not that I don't have that that feeling for humor it's just like the frustrations are gone uh it's almost like a recovery from ptsd that's right that's right you know it's just i feel good i feel happy and uh you know now i i find the other side of me the the side of me that prefers to write and engage and get out and speak and do things is far more interested in doing that because in doing and pursuing that angle now instead. So, yeah, let me ask you about that. So, so this morning, uh, or, you know, let's take your average doctor and man morning. Um, you know, what, what routine do you go through? Like, how do you make that happen every day? And then, and then also if I could add on, like what the comments, uh, that you put on the articles you share, um, how does that shape what you want to achieve with your audience? Or is that just free flow, you know, uh, opinion? Well, I'll answer the first one first, and and that's that. You know, the average day is like anybody else's day. I'm usually up by about five o'clock in the morning, a habit that you know you'll you'll find one day yourself that you just don't break. And every day is the same. Seven days a week, get up, the dogs get out, get a cup of coffee, settle down, and then start to read the news. And I and I'll skim through. You know, I'll skim through the news on Facebook. I I subscribe to some different news lists, so I'll get all that. And, and I do what I learned in Sam's, uh, which was filter all that quickly and then pick, try to pick the nuggets out. And uh, as I pick the nuggets out, uh, that's very free flowing because I'll pop an article and uh, I'll find one that might be of interest. And I try to keep things focused, try to stay apolitical as much as possible, but focusing on issues that affect us, whether it's uh, national security, uh, totally defense related, whether it's a service specific issue, whether it's a leadership issue, those kinds of things. And then pull an article up that will allow you to kind of pose a question to the audience. And, and I think, you know, there was an article this morning in the New York times about, uh, a kid who in 2007 went to join, uh, Al Qaeda when he was captured, he turned on Al Qaeda and gave all this information up and now he's poor and living from day to day and living on food stamps. And you take the article and you say, okay, 
let's ask the question, do you punish the trader or do you reward the turncoat and leave it at that? And, and, and just enough to generate discussion. And, and that's, that's kind of what I want. You know, want to get a dialogue going, especially amongst people that actually are informed on issues, which is really hard on social media these days. Uh, but get that discussion going so you can get a, a good, productive, intellectual dialogue moving. And like I said, that's really hard on social media these days because there's just as many people willing to weigh in that don't have informed opinions as people who have informed opinions. And what you hope is is that the, the, the former won't drive away the latter. And that happens a lot. Even yesterday, I think yesterday, somebody told me that all my posts were uh, uh, were Marxist focused, and I had to. I literally had to go look that up. I, I, I I'm like, how in the world do you come to that? And before the day was over, um, I was called a Satanist, and so I, I I add those two to the terms of all the obnoxious things I've been called. Uh, usually, it's politically related. And for and for a guy who like kind of rides the middle rail and stays away from both sides, it's it amazes me that it, everything always seems to come down to politics these days. Yeah, interesting, interesting. How and like how would you you touched on it a little bit? How do you describe your relationship with that audience? Has it morphed over the years? Is it the audience you would you prefer? Like the the reactions you get? Is it are they more on target with what you're looking for? He, I would say initially. Um, initially, the audience was very close. It was a smaller audience. Anything less than, uh, and this is going to sound ridiculous, but anything less than ten thousand people, you could have a pretty intimate relationship with that that audience. Um, by the time it was, f- I'd say somewhere over twenty five to fifty thousand, then it it became a little different and it started to morph, and and more people came in who just had nothing of value to add. And, and I and I experienced where for the first time where I had to start to cull the audience, and I didn't like. To, I, I'm a I'm a true believer in free speech, but there are limits to that, and and so I found that I had to put filters on, for example. So I had to put profanity filters of certain words uh, when that list has grown tremendously, uh, because you find people that have very strong opinions against women, for example, uh, uh, against you know people of other races and they would get on and say the most obnoxious things. And then you have to start culling those herds and saying, you know, I really don't want the extreme views on here because that's not productive at all. And so the audience has morphed and it's, and it's morphed significantly. But what's interesting is both audiences, the, the, at the Facebook and the Twitter audience have gone different directions. And, and so I have found that the questions that I pose on Facebook don't necessarily work as well on Twitter. So sometimes I've got to do separate posts and maintain the audiences don't cross the streams, for example. Interesting, yeah. And it's and it's fascinating uh, in a frustrating sort of way. But it's I suppose that's the natural evolution of things is that they're going to go different directions and and take different tacks and they have to be managed much differently on Twitter. There's an expectation that you will engage with every single person on an individual level that that responds to a comment. On Facebook, you can kind of get a thread going and just let the thread take its own course and just kind of monitor it and make sure that it doesn't get too obnoxious or or offensive in any way, which is, all, is a challenge because then you kind of got to sit on the thread and watch it and be really careful about what you post because some posts are going to – encourage some of the more extreme viewpoints to pop up. Yeah. Yeah. Has this, has the site created a commitment that you didn't expect you end up oh, watching it all day? I don't watch it all day. And that's, that's, that's part of the problem where I get some criticism, but I have a day job like a lot of people. And so I will get on and I will do it in the morning. And I'd say probably, uh, probably about 2013, I committed to eating lunch at the computer. And so unless I have a business lunch, I will I will have a sandwich, whatever, and I will sit down and I will go through comments, add some more news, and then I'll do it again later in the afternoon. But I step away during the day. And what I found out later on was as I step away in the day, things 
bad, bad things would sometimes happen. I might post an article, and I'm a, I'm a big believer in 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 the uh, the recruitment of talent, and, and I don't care whether that talent's male, female, whether whether you're gay. I really don't care. You want the best person for the best job at the right time, and and I would find that okay, well, I don't have an issue with. Um, Women in the infantry, for example, if, if they can, if a woman can meet the same standards as a man, hey, then then I have no argument. If you can, as long as you, as long as you're able to do the job, you're deployable when called upon, and that you're committed to to doing that job, absolutely committed, and you can live by the values of our profession. Then sure, why not? But well, there's a lot of people who don't feel that. Ninety percent of those people happen to be retired, but it's. <clears throat> You walk away from a thread where you've introduced that idea, and it can go crazy. And that would happen an awful lot. Where you'd you'd hear a, you'd get a note from somebody, and they'd say, "Oh, Doctor Man's hosting a misogynistic thread." <laughs> <You'd> say, what? <laughs> I'm not hosting a massage. And then you'd go back and look at all the horrible comments, and and um, yeah, you know, wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that's. Before we, uh, I ask you kind of what you're doing here, and which you you indicated a little bit. Um, I I got to thank you because for you know some of us uh, with you know smaller platforms, um, you know who are trying to just you know reach out and provide some value to folks out there. Um, you've been you've been uh, very generous with your you know sharing and um, and and you know kind of mentoring some of us in. And how to how to create a platform, and it has really helped. I mean, every I know Joe Byerly can can attest to it, and and Nate Finney and several others. That every time we get a Doctor Man post, it's a, it's a, it's a significant boost in the conversation. You know, we just want to we're just able to get the message out there. So we we you know sincerely appreciate you taking care of us like that. Well, it's it's interesting because. Um that's again. That's two things coming together. It's one is identifying great content, and and you produce fantastic content, and it's provocative in the in the sense that it drives dialogue, and and it's and the topics are extremely relevant. So it's it's a perfect it's a perfect storm of things coming together. I didn't know what the doctrine man effect was because I never saw it. I I never looked at the at the second order or third order reach of those kinds of those kinds of things. And I think it was Joe was the first time that somebody came to me and said, "Hey, do you know I just got like ten thousand people that looked at this, or five thousand people, and and then then you have to look at it. It has a it has a, a tertiary effect of then you have to kind of follow the Spider Man mantra of with great power comes great responsibility. You have to be very careful about what you repost because you have. And you have the potential to extend the reach of something that you don't want to extend the reach of. And and that's where, you know, there will be times where I might see a really a really an article that's completely off off base. And but it needs to be discussed. And I'll take a screenshot of that to make sure that the effect does not transfer onto that platform. Um so they don't get the they don't get the hits that they would otherwise, because frankly, if I see a stupid article on say soft rep for example, or a video that's obnoxious, I don't want to repost that to help them boost their reach. I want to I want to make the point, hey, this is not what we're about. And I think I saw one the other the other something the other day that somebody posted about uh, mentoring, that um, a woman had mentioned being sexually harassed on the job. And and she turned around. People running the mentoring site attacked her, and and you and you look at that and, and, and you think that's terrible, that's awful. But if I I can't link to what that person is doing directly because if I do, they're gonna they're gonna be encouraged to do it more, and you don't want that to happen. Yeah, interesting. You can't just slap retweet does not equal uh, endorsement. No, you know, no and, that doesn't work. Be more judicious than that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, um, well, hey, let me let me ask you about what you're doing now, and just a little bit about your career and how it transitioned into what you're doing at University of Kansas. So, uh, again, everything everything in life comes down to great stories, and and uh, I had never envisioned working here. And I was the G3 at Fort Leavenworth, and through a sequence of events, uh, I ended up having to give an overview briefing of what the Combined Arms Center does to a group of business leaders um, in uh, Kansas and Missouri. And when I was finished, it was one of those things where somebody says, hey, hey, you're the G3. Can you go over and do this? 
And I'm thinking, I don't have anything else to do today. Sure, whatever. But I went. And I'd, I'd given this pitch a hundred times. I knew it by heart. Uh, afterwards, um, a woman came up to me, gave me her business card, and said, I'd really like to talk to you. You know, would you be willing to come down to Lawrence and, and meet with me? And uh, sure, you know, I, I'm being polite. I don't know who she is. Um, she was the dean of the business school. And uh, now she's the university provost. Well, I, I went down to meet her. We had a cup of coffee. We exchanged pleasantries for two minutes. And she said, look, I'll be honest. I want to hire you. I said, well, oh, yeah, exactly. That was my response. Oh, well, um, <laughs> I kind of have a job. And she said, don't worry. Just let me know when you're ready and I'll be waiting. What do you say? And and so a couple of years go by and we stay in touch. And uh, when I decide that uh, it's time to throw my boots over the wire, she says, all right. So, well, I'll get the paperwork started. Um, when can you start? And I, I literally started five days after I retired. And it was it was only five days because it fell over the uh, over the New Year's uh, the New Year's holiday. So, <laughs> it was just kind of the way things worked out. And uh, you know, come in and and you do what you think you need to do. We're, she gave me an open platform to just kind of figure out what I wanted to do, which you don't normally get a chance like that too often. Come in, we're going to pay you about what you were getting before, and you figure out what it is that you want to do. And just kind of help us with initiatives, whatever. And um, and what department? Is that the leadership department? Well, it was in the business school. Okay. And, and I'm, a, I'm an engineer uh, by education, so I have no business experience. And I would joke that in my life, I, I, my, my main investments were in comic books and action figures. Uh, but it's only partially a joke uh, because there, I actually do have both. And it, so, okay, you're going to put me in the business school. And I, I kind of did what, you know, what any – enterprising officer would do is I looked around, I watched, I learned, and I said, hey, there's a there's a hole right here. We have all the classes that we could have a leadership program in, but we don't have a leadership program. Oh, why don't you start one? I'm like, really? That's all there is to it? Well, there was a lot more to it. Turns out that academic bureaucracy is a hell of a lot worse than anything the Pentagon wow. could ever come up mm-hmm. with. And it took two years of, of, of a, a fairly constant effort but uh, I designed a graduate program in organizational leadership, put the courses together, laid out the curriculum, and at the end of uh, the day, eventually the Board of Regents said, hey, this is a good idea. Go ahead and do it. And then they turn around and they say, well, okay, it was your idea. You're going to run it. Uh, okay, I'll run it. No, it's no problem. And now I have a, uh, an, a, a wonderful program. I only have about 24 students this year. It's our first year was this year. Uh, and they prim- we primarily service the Fort Leavenworth CGSC community, although it's open to anybody, but it's primarily built for the ideal educational experience for a CGSC major. And, I, and of course, I look at the kind of things that we went through. And so I built a program that was hybrid, that uh, the, all the leadership classes are delivered in person, uh, just off post at, a, at, a, at our small campus satellite location. And there's an online business component, so that that, that uh, you know typical statistics, counting, that kind of stuff, because the idea is that this program would then tie to an MBA. So if you're there for CGSE, you can get a master's in organizational leadership. You basically take eight classes, um, and that's good. As hybrid, so the idea was that you mix the online and in person, so I can only do class a couple times a week that way, and you still get your classes in, but you can stay at home in your underwear and do at least one class every eight weeks, and and that frees your weekends, and so it's the only program offered during CGSC where you don't have a weekend class ever. And, and, and my thing was I want to give weekends back to people because weekends are kind of sacred for us. Yeah, absolutely. That that was my decision matrix when I went to CGSC. I was like, I was like, I'm not going to go to school at you know at night and on the weekends. I'm just, I mean, yeah. you know, well, we were we were pregnant with her first, and I was like, when she comes around, I'm not going to. That oh, that's great. That's kind of like a. I kind of feel like that's a that's a maybe it's like a dream you never know you had to to create a graduate program at a at a university. Oh yeah, 
Oh, and then on the back side of the whole thing, it, it's set up so if you decide that you want an MBA, you can continue on and do an MBA after you PCS away, and it's all online. You take five more classes online, and you're finished. And you kind of do them at your own pace. So you get out, you say, okay, that first summer I can do two, and then maybe in the fall I do one, and in the spring I do one, and then all of a sudden you're done. And you do it on your own time, at your own pace, and it's still there. And it's that way you gave you, you give I would give a major the flexibility to kind of control his own educational destiny, but the ability to get a quality degree from a quality institution. And and, and that because when I went through CGSE, I didn't feel like I had that opportunity. My the the options were really limited. And so like you, I said, well, I'm not going to class at night or on a weekend if all I'm gonna get is a degree from a for profit or a second class institution. I want if I'm gonna put it on my resume, I want it to be a resume builder, not a not a resume cutter. That's right. That's right. That's fantastic. Okay, I'm now gonna point everybody that's heading to CGSC that I know over to your program. <laughs> That's a, that's a great opportunity. I certainly would have taken advantage of that had it been available. Yeah, I would have too if it yeah. had been available. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do, are you finding that the um, that the discussion on leadership – well, first let me ask you, what's the balance of uh, active duty versus civilian students that you have? Um, I have – oh, Lord. 22 of my 24 students are active duty majors – um, 20, one of the 22 are CGSC students. One is a full-time guardsman. And then I have, um, uh, a healthcare professional who, uh, was, was a military family member. And I have a 20 year veteran of the Kansas city police department, a police captain. And, and the police, the, the police have discovered this program, think it's valuable. And now I'm starting to get an influx of, of senior police, uh, police officers into go, going into next year. So it's a yeah, stream I didn't see coming. And it's interesting because I know where this leads is, you know, how's that, how's that balance work out? And it's interesting that as, as I made that transition, that now I have more and more faculty members and administrators who come to me and say, hey, what do you think about making this available to more people doing this? How, what would you think about an honors program here? Can we do this? And, and the conversation explodes. And, and it, it all goes back to that military service is introducing something that maybe was there, but, you know, other people were, you know, have that kind of background, but maybe not, um, maybe not as loud a proponency uh, for building leadership skills outside of just the traditional routes. Um, and, and it's amazing that we have these conversations because, I mean, there's even discussion within the management area where I work about, well, maybe we should stop calling it management and focus more on the leadership and do more to prepare students for uh, the, the future in business. What do you think, Steve? Well, I'll tell you what, let me tell you what I think and, and why we have an obligation to develop that next generation. And it's just fun to watch that start to take, uh, take off. Yeah. That is, that's fantastic. I didn't realize the depth of the program. Uh, congrats on that. Uh, oh, really thank cool. You. I, I, it's, uh, that's, that's kind of neat. I mean, you didn't have to do any LinkedIn or any transition conferences or anything. You just got right to it. <laughs> I got right to it. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah, let me ask you about your, you know, your military career. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious about the, the leaders that had the most impact on you, you know, the, the, uh, you know, you know, who really shaped you into the, the leader and the influencer you are today? It's it's uh, again it's 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 a it's a timely question because uh, during the during the speech that I gave last night, I touched on um, I, I touched on some of the early leadership lessons and and that uh, the the leaders who had the most influence on me and I usually point to my first platoon sergeant who I joke I, I joke that he was that kind of old school NCO who he always ran with a pack of Marlboros and a lighter rolled up in his t shirt sleeve. Uh, because he wanted to have a cigarette as soon as we finished running. He was that kind of an NCO. And, but we would spend our Saturdays at his house. And it's one of the Dr. Man jokes touches on Ham's beer. Well, on Saturdays, I would go to my platoon sergeant's house and we would sit in Lazy Boys and we would watch um, public television. As he would say, we're watching damn flowers grow. And, and we would drink Ham's beer and he would share you know, the wisdom of his 15 years, um, 
as an enlisted as an enlisted member. And and those were all lessons that stuck with me. And it was all about taking good care of your troops, treating them like family, not like children, but like family. And the different aspects of hey, taking risk. Um, of my one of my favorite quotes of, of his was, you know, if you're not getting your ass chewed once in a while, you're not doing your job. And it was be willing to stretch yourself. Be willing to take risks for people and and do what's right by them. He had his own way of imparting those those lessons, and then most of them were profane, but they were incredibly valuable. And so he was probably my first mentor. And it took me 20 years, maybe 25 years, to realize he had mentored me, and he really had, because I I, I always thought of the traditional, um, you know. I didn't have a lot of senior officer mentors until late in my career. I always had my NCOs. And then my uh, the next one was my uh, my senior maintenance chief, who was a, a crusty W-4, who he believed rightly. And he taught me that if you really want to get something done, then you either get a cup of coffee or a lunch, and you sit down with somebody, and you break bread. And... And and that was something that a lot of people just aren't comfortable doing, but I learned to do that through him. And we would spend hours at the Fort Campbell uh, Sportsman's Lodge, the Rod and Gun Club, for all-you-can-eat schnitzel. That was his thing, all-you-can-eat Jaeger schnitzel. And, and we would spend hours talking about life, about leadership, and about the technical aspects of, of the job. And I was, a, I was a maintenance officer early on in my career. I was a logistician for the first uh, 13, 14 years. And um, so he would share all this. And it had just a profound impact on how I approached leadership in, in an odd in an odd sort of way because I became, as a young officer, I didn't have necessarily the calming influence of, you know, the the, the more senior mentor. I instead had had the, the 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 NCOs and the warrant side of me that was pushed strongly, which was take risk, don't be afraid, take your ass chewing, take them like a man, just just get it out there. And so I became I became somebody who was often accused of not having a filter. I learned how to I learned how to temper that filter later on in life, but I would always just tell it like it was. Hey, here's here's the deal. Oh my God, you can't say that. Uh, oh, it's too late now. It's already out. Um, and and as a, so as a young as a young officer, that that was my development. And then later on in life, um, I, I found that I had more senior folks, especially when I transitioned to being a strategist. My last that last half of my career. I worked almost exclusively at the three or four star level, and I, I get a lot of mentoring about how to, how to polish my approach to things, um, how, how to be a little more, little more. I, I don't want to say politically astute in what I said. I was still that person who was very blunt, and I never stopped, but I softened the blows a little bit, and I learned to do that through the general officer uh, mentoring that I received. Okay. Well, let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. Do you do you think that there is room? In, in today's army for more of that? I mean, do we need to be able, you know, even subordinates to speak up to, uh, to, to commands and leaders and say, you need to consider this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and I look at my own experience as an example. Uh, I survived being that person. And you can. It's just, if anything, this is where mentoring is so important. And because you've got to have somebody close by to say, okay, look, Drew, yes, you can say that, but here's a better way to say that. And and you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to be that blunt, but you can be that direct. And, and there are ways to say things and, and ways and times to say things. And, and that's, that's another piece that I've been wanting to work on is, is you can be just as direct as you need to be. But there are there are ways and times to say things, and and uh, I go back to, um, I think it was um, I was probably working for uh, General Cody at the time as a division planner, and and he was extremely blunt and direct, and but but also really good about you know he'd look at you and say hey look. That's not how you want to say that. Let me tell you how to say that. And they tell you a story and say, okay, well, I screwed that up. I won't do it again. So we need to have that open, honest dialogue. It just doesn't have to hurt all the time. And and the problem that most people run into that they don't want to admit is that they say the wrong thing at the wrong time. 
and in front of the wrong audience. And there are ways to get your point across. Sometimes it's okay to wait until after the meeting to, to lean over to the boss and say, hey, look, that wasn't the way to do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. I've, I've had that said to me a couple of times. <laughs> um, uh, that's good. Well, okay. So speak, so ideas, uh, this, you know, being able to communicate and, and kind of learn and grow and, uh, you know, it takes putting it out there, right? It takes being able to yeah. say, this is what I believe. And, um, you know, this is my position. So what I'm curious, so why is that important for leaders? And we'll just, we'll, we'll keep it with the military here. And why it's important for military leaders to communicate and then specifically, right. I mean, so online engagement, you know, I mean, why is it important for, to put your ideas out there and stand on a position? I, 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 I've always believed that what it does is it allows you to say, here's where I stand and here's what I think and, and, and allow people to engage. Um, and it, it opens, it opens up that platform because people don't have to agree with you, but if you can open up that platform and say, this is what Andrew Stedman believes on this issue. This is where I stand. And, and, and this is what we're going to do. I'm, I'm, I'm welcome. You know, you're welcome to engage and talk to me about it. And it allows people to have a voice, and and so they can never come back later and say, "Hey, you know, you just you just could, you just decided this, and there was no opportunity to discuss it." Uh, and I had concerns here and there. You give people the opportunity to engage with you. You open up that dialogue, and that's incredibly powerful as a leader. Uh, it's also scary because you're you're not going to get everybody who agrees with you, and you're going to get people who are. Uh, fervently opposed to what you're doing, but they'll always be able to say that you took the time and gave them the platform to be able to disagree and and engage you. And at the same time, you learn. I learn every single time I have a I have an engagement like that, or I open up a thread. I learn so much, and I've learned a tremendous amount by doing so. And I and every time I had a thread that went the wrong way, I still learned and I was able to apply it later on. And it always, it always applied professionally and, and encouraging others to do that is, is absolutely the right thing to do. It's, it's not fun all the time, but it's valuable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to ask you about the military writers guild, you know, back in, back in 2014, it seemed like you know, amongst the several of us who were there at the at the founding of the the guild, that there was it seemed like there was this momentum, or at least this potential energy for something to coalesce, some type of organization, uh, be, because of uh, I think all the the folks that were popping up and and the writing in the in the social media space, it just felt like there was this um, there just needed to be some some type of umbrella to capture us. Um, you know, in the, 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 the guild, uh, has, you know, has become a collection of well over a hundred uh, writers who. Um, contribute to the space and help mentor others. You know, what does the guild provide that wasn't there before? Well, that's a that's honestly the hardest question you've asked, um, and it's a question that we still pose to ourselves today. Uh, in the last, I'd say, probably eight months or so, we stood up a, a board of directors at the guild to to explore some of these same things. We had the guild. the The original idea was to provide. Um, some kind of an organizing construct that writers, especially writers of the military uh, genre, could come together, exchange ideas, maybe get some mentoring assistance, uh, help with publication. And that was the original intent. But we had a, I think we had a really hard time getting our hands around what we were doing and how we were going to do that. And, and so we, we had an organization that's actually about 150 people now. But the problem is I think we only have about 50 members that actually actively engage on any level. And and, and so we struggle with that. And, and part of it is people go back and ask, what does the guild do? What's our what's our reason for existence? And and that we maybe didn't define that well enough early enough. And so we're going back and re-exploring that. We know inherently what it is that we want to do, but we want to make sure that we communicate that clearly and that when a new member comes in, that we give them the structure of, hey, this is a place where you can go, that you can share what you're writing, you can get editorial assistance, you can get mentoring, you can get help um, – finding um, platforms 
for your writing. Uh, just, just the other day, um, uh, AUSA reached out to me, and um, they want to be able to extend their publication services for uh, long-form publication for book-length uh, uh, manuscripts to members of the guild. So the guild, the me guild members know that if they have a transcript or a, a full-length manuscript, they can submit it through AUSA, and AUSA will help them find an agent, help them find a publisher, and and those are the right, really. Those are the values. The, va the kind of valuable things that we can offer, but we've got to make sure people understand that. And and so we're going through that whole process of, of I will I don't want to say reinvention, but uh, relooking our 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 core uh, our the pillars of the organization and what we stand for. We all think we know what they are, but not everybody else does. And then reengaging with the membership and. To that end, we started an initiative um, in November to, and you're a part of that, as you well know, to publish our first uh, anthology, our first writing anthology, which is focused on why we write and, and what drives you as an individual to write and, and the kind of things that you write. Because we know that there's an entire community of writers out there that may know about us but don't know enough about us. And this gives all those writers a voice. And we have a tremendous um, array of great writers. Uh, some, are, some are very well known. Uh, some, some are, you know, they might be anonymous, but they still have a story to tell. And bringing all that together, and we are looking to publish that in the September, October time frame. We're early on in the editing process right now. But again, an, an effort to bring the guild together and give it a voice and be able to say, Hey, we've accomplished some things. We're doing some things. And we think that this will drive uh, kind of a renaissance in how we operate as a guild. Yeah. yeah that's, that's fantastic. I, I, I kind of feel like writing and contributing to the professional body of knowledge is something that every professional should engage in over the course of a career, you know, and, and, and just make something that's part of their, you know, part of their engagement, you know, inside and outside the chain of command. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've personally just grown so much just as an individual uh, by by writing and, and diving into the topics of leadership. And uh, I mean, I encourage everybody I can to uh, to contribute. I, I really like that the guild uh, it does that and provides a, a platform and an umbrella for, you know, to, to take on folks who want to contribute. Well, if you think about it in this in this respect, you're a beacon. You, Drew Stedman, you're a beacon for leadership. And and the longer that you do that and the more that you write and the more that you engage, the more people turn to you and see you as an example of what right looks like. And and that's the kind of leader that we need to have out in the force is that somebody who's recognized early as as a thought leader, as um, – as a as a shining beacon of what right looks like, and, and there's no better way to say that, and and then you become that model for what other people want to be, and that's what that's what we have to do if we if we're really serious about developing the next generation of leaders, we got to have people that aren't just wearing stars who do that engagement, and become and become that voice of 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 doing the right thing and how we do the right thing. And the way you engage your audience is absolutely brilliant because you you do that. You go online and you put yourself out there and you and you you don't just say, hey, this is the way it is. You you do it in a way that that encourages people to talk about it, to argue about it, to debate it. And and it's very positive and productive. And I know that that, that, that there will be a day when lieutenants just sit around in a room and they talk about what they read on the military leader that day. And, and you will have, and, and these are people that you won't know and that you've never seen. And, and you are the topic of the day every day when they sit in a room and they talk about the military leader and you've, and you've done it in a way that is that, that you, it's not Drew Stedman. It's, it's the military leader. And, and it's funny because I've talked about, I've talked about both what you and Joe do and people, people. So, so let's say I run into a National Guard captain, and he's talking about what he saw on on three by five leadership or from the Green Notebook. They don't they don't attach a name to it, but they attach a topic to it, and and they attach a tremendous amount of value to what you bring. And 
and it's just there, there's a sense of pride that I feel personally when I realize how much that you and the others have done for us as a profession and as an institution and that you just don't get enough credit for just the tremendous impact that you're having already and what you will have going into the future. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Oh, you're that's, welcome. that's very kind. I appreciate that. You know, I, I mean, I'm ex- really excited to see uh, the, the contributions that have come, you know, popped up in the last you know, several years. Uh, we have NCOs starting to, to fill the writing space here and contribute. Um, I mean, I think the, the effect is carrying over to other countries. You know, look at Australia and even the UK is starting to, yes. um, to, to add their individual voice, which is a big deal for that, you know, for that military. Um, you know, they don't they don't have the open kind of con- contributive culture that we do. So it's really exciting to see. Um, so like, wh- where is this? Where does the movement go? You know, when you know, when junior, when leaders and, you know, junior and mid-level leaders can contribute uh, to a, uh, into the platform, uh, you know, on their own platforms and into the sphere and into the professional dialogue, like where did, you know, what do we do with that? Where does it go? I, it's interesting that you say that because um, I think where this ultimately leads is we had a, we had a discussion when we talked about the human dimension and talent management a few years ago, we talked about optimizing human performance and really optimizing how a leader performs. And so if you believe that the current system probably gets you to about the 70 to 75% solution for what a leader should be, how do you get that extra 20, 25%? And, and I think that's where this leads because these are the kinds of discussions that you want to have in organizations. But frankly, we just very few organizations get to this. Um, I know your battalion will. I know that you've got uh, folks like Kurt Taylor, a friend of mine who's a brigade commander now. He gets his people to that level. But by and large, we're going to get that that move, that last 25 percent. That's going to come through through efforts like this. And what we're going to see is we're going to see more engagement earlier until that becomes the norm and it's not the exception anymore where people say, hey, I'm, you know, I can teach an entire class off what you post. And and then you become and and you and Joe and and the others become the platforms for how we grow and develop. And, and then we that achieves the optimization and leadership that we're looking for. And we lose what that other 25 percent is is actually missing already. But but we get to that optimization level. And so we get to the 90% solution that we hope we get to as leaders and we do it earlier. And we have, and, and you know, as a, uh, as a professional that when you're at the three or four year mark, if you don't feel like you're contributing, then you don't stay. This gives you an opportunity to engage early and often and continue to engage throughout your career. So you always feel like you're making a difference. And so there's a whole professional satisfaction piece of that where this leads to. And let's just at the end of the day, if we have a profession where you feel like you can engage on any topic at any time and and gain from it, then then we have achieved something that is is totally unique that that we can celebrate and that's that's the ultimate goal i think yeah absolutely well said that's good steve um um it is a it is a fun community to be around and uh oh yeah uh, to to see you know i think i kind of take i really jump on seth godin's approach here when you stand you know the in the morning and and you and you hit publish you know you put your thoughts down (laughs) and you hit publish and you stand on your beliefs and your intellectual and even if they're, they're, they're un, um, you know, even if they're not fully developed, even if you're still developing who you are, you know, there's intellectual strength in hitting publish and saying, I'm just throwing this out there, uh, and, and I'm going to grow from it. And, uh, yeah. I, I think as a, as a professional, I mean, that culture here, um, is, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun to see. I'm, I'm at a, um, uh, a good time watching it, you know, like Doug Meyer, for example, um, uh, he, you know, he just an article of his of his just got picked up uh, for HBR online, you know, Harvard Business Review. Yeah. And I'm like, man, that is I mean, for a captain, to, you know, just just out of company command to write an article for Harvard Business Review uh, is uh, it's just really something. It's really neat to see. It is. It is. So, Steve, I wanted to ask you about uh, balancing uh, army and family life, because it's something everyone has to 
has to struggle with in some point and, and it ends up being the date night conversation uh, typically uh, you know so but how have you done it over the years what are you know how have you dealt with the demands of the army and, and making time for your family and it's always a challenge um, something I discussed last night was that when I when I came to the end of my career I had been in uniform for 28 years and and my wife had kept track and 10 of those years we were apart either from deployments or CTC rotations or field time or TDYs or schools whatever but we've been apart 10 of those 28 years and and it's not uncommon i mean if i'm sure any of us when we look back you'll find that there's there's gaps where we're just not there and and so balance becomes all the more important and and one of the things i discussed last night with the group that i was with was how you do exactly that? How do you maintain that balance? And um, you know, it was my first company commander, uh, a guy named Clem Ward, who Clem set an example for me when I was a uh, still a second lieutenant. And every night at, at eighteen hundred, he would step up, stand up, step away from his desk, put things away, and leave. Every night at 1800, didn't matter what was going on. He always did it. And when I asked him why, he said, because you can't wait until you retire to get to know your family. You've got to force yourself to make the time. And, and Clem was an anomaly um, uh, because, you know, in a profession where a lot of us measure um, our value through the amount of time we stay at the job, he wasn't like that. And, and yet – in every aspect of his life, Clem was, without a doubt, um, an example. He was the most physically fit person in our, in our, as a company commander in the entire battalion. The guy, he, he was he, absolutely the most physically fit. His technical acumen, top of the top of the range. I mean, there wasn't anything he didn't know. But on the other side, he was extremely humble. He was very positive. He was absolutely family, you know, committed to his family. So he had found that balance, and you know, he was willing to, um, he was willing to do something that very few leaders are, and that's that he was willing to take risk to achieve that balance. And and he counted on his ability to maintain, you know, he as he maintained everything else. At a very high level, he was willing to say, hey, I'm going to step away from the job at a certain time because I want to be with my family. And and that was something that I always carried with me. And I, I, I tried, I strive to do that, but it's very difficult to do. But you've got to you've you've got to be willing to take that time. And you have to have leaders who are willing to allow you to say, hey, you know, I got to go to my daughter's dance recital or, you know, my son's band is going to play tonight and I want to go hear them. You've got to have leaders that, are, that say, "Hey, you know what? That's cool. Go ahead. I'm totally." And I, and so as I grew as a leader, as I developed over time, I was always okay with that. And so when I had a subordinate who said, "Hey, look, you know, my my kid's got a soccer game tonight. Like, go watch the soccer game. Go be there so they know you're there. Like, this will be here tomorrow. And if it's that, if it's that time sensitive, then we'll find a way to manage it. But I will, as your boss, give you that time. I, I and and I ex, I establish that expectation early on is that you'll you'll find that balance and I'll help you find that balance. And in the 28 years, I think I only had one person um, who refused to do that. And he had issues of his own and refused you know, like he just he worked too long or I mean, he just he 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 was he refused to adapt. He worked really long. He he abused his subordinates. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, he, he and I had a fundamental difference of philosophical approach is that when I was willing to say, hey, you go be with your family, he would not. And. Unfortunately, he worked for me, which meant I had the trump card, and I played that trump card every single time. And I would tell him, hey, if your people aren't getting out and if your people don't get that, that's on you. It's not on them because you didn't manage them properly. You didn't lead them the way you should. And so he would look at me and see weakness because I was willing to allow people to, to have that time. And I looked at him and saw weakness as well. You know, you've got a problem. I don't have a problem. I, I want them to – 
I want them to know their family and celebrate their family while they still have an opportunity to do so. Because I don't want to be that 55-year-old guy who steps away from the table, goes home and looks at his family and says, Man, I haven't seen you guys in 25 yeah, years. What have you exactly. been up to? Yeah, exactly. That's right. We're all going to step out of the step out of the army one day, and exactly. you know, what's going to be yeah. there is the family. Yeah, had a had a, a boss of mine um, when I was a squadron commander, or when, when he was squadron commander when I was a three, and and he made it a point to uh, always pick up the phone if his wife called. Like if we were in a meeting or something like that, he would stop the meeting and answer a phone call from his wife, and he made everyone else say, "If your spouse calls, you need to answer the phone because you know that's yeah. the most important person." It was like that sent just a fantastic message and support. It of that. does. And then you have to do that kind of thing. Um, I learned, I learned, I learned that one the hard way. We had a, we were PCSing once, and we had a mover have a heart attack in front of the house. My wife did C, my wife did CPR and called nine one one, and and she was calling, and I was ignoring the calls because I was I was busy. I was in a meeting, and when I finally took the calls, she's like, "Stop what you're doing and come home." I'm like, oh, I can't. I'm at work. She goes, "You're coming home right now." And and after that. I never, I never ignored a call from her again. Oh, wow. You just don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Hey, yeah, that's true. Oh, great. Hey, um, well, Steve, thanks so much. Um, you know, if you, you're I want to give it the opportunity to, to just inject one lesson into the audience. You know, if you're talking to junior leaders across the, you know, across the, the army or, you know, whatever service or even civilian leaders out there uh, who need to hear a message, uh, you know, from you, what, what would you tell them right now? So it, it, I'm glad you asked this because this is the the one thing that I try to share the most, and and I've mentioned a little bit here and there, but it's it's how we approach risk as leaders. And when we published uh, the 2008 uh, edition of FM30, the Army's Capstone Operational How We Fight Doctrine, I I slip in a little piece that I thought was critical. Because we always talk about, you know, the fundamentals of seizing the initiative and 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 war is a battle of wills. And but the funny thing is everything comes down to risk. And so there's a sentence in that in that version that says, risk is a potent catalyst that fuels opportunity. And it's tied it's tied into the discussion that if you want to take the initiative, if you wanna if you wanna seize the momentum You've got to be willing to take risk to do so because the window of opportunity doesn't open unless you're willing to take risk. And and so it's antithetical to a lot of people to take that risk. And they don't understand that on the back side of that is you will never be able to seize the initiative if you're not willing to accept risk to do so. And so pushing people to understand that risk isn't a bad thing. You've got to be able to understand the risk that you're taking, mitigate the you know the the negative consequences of that risk, but you've got to be willing to take the risk if you want to achieve great success, and and that's a lesson that we can't teach people enough that it's that the, that as leaders we have to be willing to take risks, and as leaders we have to be willing to allow people to make mistakes, honest mistakes, best made in a training environment. But it's, it's a it's a two part equation, and if we if we if we're willing to take the risk, if we're willing to accept those honest mistakes, then we can honestly seize the initiative from our opponents, and and we can have an, a tremendous amount of success. But it all goes back to risk and the willingness to accept it. That's the one thing that you can't teach people enough. That's great. That's fantastic advice, Steve. Um, and it, it, every day, every day in training and every day in leadership. That's uh, that's. That's valuable insight. That's great. Well, I, I got to tell you, um, you know, I, I appreciate you taking the time to do this um, and, and to, to chat with me. And, and you know, thanks for um, everything that you pour into uh, not only, you know, the, the Doctrine Man audience, which is uh, sometimes fickle, like, in a, you know, it sounds <laughs> like, um, you know, but just, uh, you know, your post army life is is you're pouring right back into you know the professional development of, of leaders out there who are going to go back and have an impact you know for our future so uh, just thanks for everything uh, that you've done for that and then for us uh, us uh, you know writing out there and contributing um, and we appreciate your your support and uh, look forward to many more years of collaboration oh outstanding and, and thank you for taking the time out on a sunday morning to you know to spend an hour with me after the time change because not not everybody would do that and i appreciate it yeah no worries at all steve well thanks so much and uh, uh we'll talk to you soon 
Thank you. Awesome chat there with Steve Leonard. You know, I love his take on risk right at the end there. That was good stuff. I hope you enjoyed it. Next time you see Dr. Man pop up in your news feed, you'll know the backstory and how Steve makes it happen. All right, for next time, I'll share my conversation with Colonel Scott Shaw. Scott is an infantry officer, future brigade commander, and just completed senior service college. If you haven't seen his sizable AAR on his time as a battalion commander in the 3rd Infantry Division, head over to themilitaryleader.com right now and check it out. It's really good stuff. Okay, here's a clip from next week's interview with Colonel Scott Shaw. You didn't solve all your commander's problems. So how did, how did you balance what to jump in and solve versus something that, may, that they might learn more from if they did their own? The, the hardest, that is the hardest thing uh, in command. It was for me. I mean, I won't say this for everybody because we spend a lot of time as staff officers serving commanders. And, um, you, you know, you, there you are, hands on hips. Dun, da, da, I'm here to solve problems. Um, and, and, you know, and I, and I sat there and thought to myself of all the things that I learned um, as a lieutenant, as a captain, whether they were deliberate or happenstance, the best ones I learned were ones I learned on my own. It was, there was no, um, I mean, there wasn't a magic, you know, somebody comes down and says, see, here's the lesson. Um, I mean, I, I came to a conclusion on my own. Be sure to look for that interview with Colonel Scott Shaw next week. It's a good one. You're going to enjoy it. You can find this episode and more leader development content at themilitaryleader.com. Music for the Military Leader Podcast was composed by Ilya Rayovsky. The opinions expressed here do not represent the U.S. government in any way. As always, thank you for listening and lead well.